Hi everyone, Patrick Tickle here. We're now off to Chicago, Illinois for a practitioner presentation with David Deffelson of WMS Gaming and Paul Tran from one of our sponsors, Bright Idea. WMS Gaming has a rich history of innovation in the gaming world, from pinball to video games to slot machines. David, with a little help from Paul, is today going to take us through the WMS Gaming history in idea management. Thanks, Patrick. David, thanks for joining today. Nice to be here, Paul. Thanks. So let's uh, jump right into it. <clears throat> so well, why did your company want to start an idea management system five years ago? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I'd like to uh, take a step back and say that uh, WMS has historically been a very creative company and going back to where we uh, started with Harry Williams designing the very first tilt mechanism for pinball games. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, innovation in that space, uh, getting into video arcade games later on and then uh, finally into slot machines. Our company has always uh, tried to push the boundaries of our products and question the status quo. And so in about 2007, we were experiencing some rapid growth uh, in our company, both in terms of revenue and employee count. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were capturing that special culture that had always been in our company which was the fact that we were a company of ideas. And so we wanted to make sure that everybody in the company uh, continued to have that innovative voice, uh, be able to share their ideas, and we figured an online platform where we can start to move our collaboration there uh, would just help make sure that we kept that special part of our culture going forward. Great, great. And can you tell us, tell us a little bit about how it's being used today? Um, yeah, so there are several different ways that companies can use idea management systems and uh, one of the things that we were always driven to was to make sure that we were focused on our company culture. And so we're using it um, to mainly make sure that we have internal employee collaboration. Uh, that has turned into uh, ways of having invention disclosures with our IP uh, and patents group and uh, also uh, having focused challenges uh, from managers to try to solve certain business problems. Great, great. So let's cut to the chase, David. What sorts of results have you seen from your program? All right, well, it is all about results, right, ultimately? So I'm happy to say that over the five years of our program, uh, we have, uh, the ideas that have gone through the system have resulted in uh, 64, patent applications directly, and probably about another 20 or 25 ideas have uh, been used for something called uh, defensive publishing, which is another um, IP uh, approach that we can take. And those have specifically come from challenge-based campaigns, which we'll could talk about in a, a little while. In addition to that, we also have our idea management system uh, deployed onto our uh, manufacturing shop floor. And there, our union employees and our managers are using this system to capture and uh, implement a lot of continuous improvement ideas. And to date, we have uh, logged over 110 uh, continuous improvement ideas uh, that we can uh, show and demonstrate that have really led to things like efficiency savings, uh, waste reduction, and coming up with just smarter ways to work and ultimately safety as well. Uh, some examples that we could talk about are, uh, you know, sometimes they're, they're obvious things uh, in retrospect where one employee was looking at the way that we uh, hang the rolls of plastic uh, that we use to wrap some of our equipment on. And he said, instead of hanging them horizontally, what if we were to turn them vertically and save a lot of space? Uh, we said, that seems like an obvious idea, and we tried it, and it actually worked. Um, another idea that I thought was personally pretty clever was that at another station in our manufacturing floor, we had to create uh, these things that we call top boxes in the industry, and then we would pick them up, uh, carry them over, and then stack them from the floor up, and then carry them off on a dolly. Well, instead, 
uh, somebody came up with the idea that said, why don't we use this uh, hydraulic jack and slide the top uh, boxes over, and then instead of building them from the top up, we can actually uh, stack them from the top down and lower the jack as we need to, uh, which was a very clever new way of doing work. And on top of that, the jack that was being used uh, for this idea had been sitting uh, near the garbage uh, being completely unutilized. So there's a lot of creativity going on in our shop floor and uh, this has been a really good platform to harness that and show that employees not only have the power to have ideas to improve their work life and, and their workstations, uh, but also provide some real cost savings for the company as well. Um, we also have had about 40 campaigns that have uh, uh, focused on specific business challenges that different managers have had. And uh, one of them that uh, we're proud to announce is a naming contest that we had for our newest slot machine cabinet. And uh, it was pretty cool that uh, this uh, employee of ours named Harry, uh, who is an account executive out near the West Coast, uh, he answered the call and he said, you know, I have a good idea for a name. Why don't we call it The Blade? Mm -hmm. And it was a very popular name that rose to the top uh, when we did some voting on all of the names that were submitted. It went through a regulation check and uh, for, for uh, trademarks. And as it turns out, that was the name that we went with. So we're very happy that uh, uh, Harry, who never really comes over to the corporate offices, has really nothing to do with marketing, was still able to participate in that process. So you've been running this program for five years now. And how has the program evolved over time? You know, I like the fact that you used evolution uh, because our program does continue to change as we learn how to use it more and get it more widely adopted into our company and our culture. Uh, you know, one of the big pivots that we uh, undertook in our program over the last five years is that when we first got started, we had this ideal that we wanted any idea from anybody about anything and they could submit it at any time, right? It was, it was a wonderful concept and, and that was part of that, that special uh, ingredient of our culture that we wanted to preserve. So we, w we definitely opened it up to everybody and said, if you have an idea, submit it and we'd love to, to hear about it. Well, as it turns out, uh, we were surprised by this, but that's actually not a good idea. <laughs> and, and let me explain why. Because um, when you ask for ideas, you'll get exactly that. And pe people were giving us hundreds of ideas, thousands of ideas, and in fact, we couldn't process them all. And the system seized up. Um, we were having uh, ideas that were coming in and they weren't necessarily directed towards things that were company priorities. They were fantastic ideas, but we couldn't necessarily make all of them actionable. And so uh, if we didn't start to uh, respond to all of these ideas, then over time uh, the idea submitters kind of got a little frustrated and the activity started to dwindle. And that was the exact opposite uh, of what we wanted to do. Uh, we were also having uh, submissions into our system that we've dubbed idea hand grenades. And an idea hand grenade is something where you come out and say, yeah, I have a good idea. Why don't you change the way that you do something so that my life is easier, right? It's really difficult to kind of get those ideas uh, adopted and, and implemented. Um, so uh, we, we, we had that issue that we kind of had to, to change. And then finally, if there was a really good idea, there wasn't really necessarily uh, a mechanism to empower those people that had ideas on how to move forward with them. So we had to take a step back and say, okay, well, you know, what, what is it that we're going to do here? Well, what we did was we changed to more from an open suggestion box to a, f a focused challenge and campaign paradigm with our process. So in the old way, uh, there could be an idea about anything uh, in, in any direction. But instead, we went from an idea push to more of a solution pull, and that uh, required the statement of 
a strategic means up front. Once we can identify what is a challenge that we want, now anybody could submit an idea towards that challenge and the quality might be feasible or it might not, but at least it's on target for something that the company has prioritized and wants to try to solve. That's, a, that's an interesting insight and uh, glad you could share that with us. Um, let's talk about the me mechanics for a bit, you know, the program mechanics. Can you take us through the process of actually running a campaign? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so now that we are focused on trying to come up with a, a problem to solve, an, an innovative challenge, the way that the process begins is that um, I uh, will typically reach out to uh, a business manager uh, or a functional leader, maybe a vice president, and start to have the conversation to say, are there challenges that you're facing right now that you may not uh, know how to, to get beyond? Maybe you want some new thinking about a particular topic. Or if you're looking to transform your organization to say, we are here today, but we want to be there tomorrow. Right? So that actually takes a little bit of, 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 of time and soul searching to actually figure out what is the future state you want to achieve. So that is the work that we do with the sponsor of a challenge. Once we uh, have that sort of nailed down, we work uh, with, uh, usually the, the sponsor will designate somebody we call a campaign manager. And the campaign manager is the person who is responsible for working out uh, the day-to-day -day mechanics of a campaign. And what we'll do there is uh, now it's myself, the, the sponsor, and the manager, and we'll start to talk uh, to, to frame the conversation and how we can communicate this out to the company at large. And one of the important things to establish is what is the minimal entry criteria for an idea? So uh, it might be something like, uh, you know, if it's a cost savings idea, we want cost savings of $50,000 or more. Or, or maybe it's 5000 It really doesn't matter. But by setting the hurdles of what we think would be a good idea that the sponsor is interested in, then right away we're starting to be able to create a bar of entry so that the ideas that come in will be meaningful to the sponsor. So once we have the constraints, the minimal acceptance criteria, and the problem statement framed, then uh, we start the solution gathering process. That's really where we're executing this. This is where we advertise the, uh, the problem, put uh, uh, table tents out, uh, market the campaign uh, on our intranet and newsletters, things like that. And this is where everybody is now participating and throwing out ideas, collaborating, um, uh, uh, putting comments on top of the ideas and elaborating them and creating something bigger. That process runs for probably two to three weeks. Um, in our experience, uh, interest starts to, uh, to wane after about three weeks, and then the fourth week you might get a, a, a couple of more submissions. But then we go into an evaluation phase where we have subject matter experts that uh, have the full trust and confidence of the sponsor to come in and they look uh, at the submissions and the conversations that have come in. They uh, look at the idea and sort of give it a, a scorecard uh, review uh, which also is one of the things that I recommend you do before you field a campaign. And then we triage the ideas. We go back to the campaign manager and say, uh, based on what the evaluators thought, we either have ideas that we say, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Not, we're not really moving forward with that. We have the ideas that are said, you know, there's really something here, but it might need a little bit more work. Maybe this is a, we're interested, but a low priority. And then we finally have, you know what, these are great ideas. We, I recommend we move forward with these. And then when you get, bring that list back to the sponsor, it really completes the circle to where they say, I had a, a goal to go from here to there, and now I have a triaged list of high priority things that we should move forward with. Yeah. And so that is uh, perhaps a, a, a lengthy explanation, but a pretty detailed one about the mechanics of how our uh, campaigns work. Yep, yep. And I think that's important to understand how the mechanics of a single campaign works. Um, how many campaigns are you running at any given time? And, and can you describe 
a schedule or, or, uh, or how you schedule that out over the year. I think uh, you had mentioned earlier um, something called strategy deployment. Is that something you can describe? Sure, sure. Okay, so the first part of your question was uh, how many campaigns do we run at a time? And in our experience, um, we seem to see about three or four campaigns seem to be uh, a good amount uh, any more and the uh, employee base starts to get maybe a little confused and, and the energy uh, starts to get kind of diffuse. Uh, if you only have one or, or two, um, that could get a little boring if that's all that you have on there for uh, an entire month. So in our experience, now different companies might uh, have different results, but for us, the sweet spot seems to be about three to four campaigns uh, running at any one time. Now, uh, you, you also talked about how you can uh, schedule these things out in a longer period of time, and, and we do that uh, through, uh, and one of the mechanisms that, that we use is this, this uh, pr program that we have in our company called Strategy Deployment. Now, Strategy Deployment is uh, a process, that, a business process that we have where the CEO and president really set some big, hairy, audacious goals for the entire company to uh, try to achieve this year. These are things that would be uh, difficult, if not impossible, for single groups to do. These are things that really take the entire company uh, in alignment to work uh, forward towards. But since these are stated as strategic goals and objectives for the company that, in a sense, are sort of stretch goals, then they make perfect uh, seeds for campaigns uh, that we could put uh, on our system uh, because the, the goal by definition is trying to attain something that the company isn't doing currently. So uh, we can uh, usually break down the larger goals into smaller goals and then when those are typically assigned to be executed uh, by a manager or, or a functional lead then we will schedule out a whole program throughout the year and you can uh, see in this graph here how we kind of stagger the execution of one with the planning of the next one as well as the evaluation of the, of the previous one. So we kind of get a, a whole flow and it actually ends up telling kind of a story over the whole year of how we're tackling the larger problem. Yeah, sounds like a very structured process in how you manage innovation, that's, that's great. Um, can you quickly talk about how you sustain participation in the system over time? Maybe some of the rewards and recognition uh, concepts that you guys have implemented. Sure, okay. Well, um, we've changed this a little bit over time as well. And um, one of the things that we started out uh, trying to do was we were thinking if people are coming up with great ideas for uh, cost savings, for example, maybe we could provide uh, a bounty or some kind of percentage or, or something. If they save a million dollars, you know, maybe they should get 10% uh, of that as a reward. Uh, we didn't end up going with that kind of thing, uh, and, and I'm glad we didn't for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, that we do for rewards uh, and recognition uh, are that when an idea does come in and it passes its uh, minimal uh, entry criteria into a campaign, that in itself qualifies as a, as a valid uh, idea, a valid point of consideration. So what we do is we have uh, raffles for the individual campaigns. And for all of the ideas that uh, come in and meet that first level of, of acceptance, we will have a raffle for like a $25 or $50 gift card. And what that does is the behavior that it incentivizes is to have a, uh, a certain quantity of ideas that come in into the campaign. So if you are specifically prolific at a particular topic, the more qualified ideas you submit, the more entries you have into the raffle. So, uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, again, it's not a big monetary prize because uh, we found that a lot of the people uh, who've given us feedback is that they're not even really looking for large bounties on their ideas. Uh, what they want to do, the number one uh, reward, that intrinsic reward that they feel about participating is the ability to be recognized for having a good idea and ultimately the opportunity to participate in the implementation of their idea. 
So we try to do that at every step along the way. And oftentimes, just being able to work on your idea uh, it has been a tremendous uh, uh, successful reward in and of itself. And um, you know, as we've said, too, we always want to try to make sure that we do publicize uh, our success stories. So you know, Harry uh, Bedell, who uh, came up with our, our blade name and everything, we want to make sure that we tell our success stories as well. That's great. Yeah, you're right. I think people, you know, you underestimate. People really want to be heard. Uh, it's great you have a platform to do that. Um, so let's, uh, you know, this, this journey hasn't always been uh, smooth, right? I mean, you, there, I've got to imagine there's been some bumps in the road. Can you uh, share with us some of the lessons learned you've had over the last five years? Sure. Uh, all right. So I would say that um, one of the things that is important to know is that y you have to manage expectations properly. Uh, manage expectations of everybody in, in the system. And what I mean by that is um, when you're uh, talking to the idea submitters, you want to make sure that you communicate that uh, in, in our new system now, we have particular topics for which we are accepting creative ideas for. There's still people who want to, th there's still the, the drive for the open suggestion box and say, yeah, but I have a great idea about something. and my response to them is to say that, you know, please just wait a little while and you might find that a campaign addresses your concern. Uh, or try to find a way in which your idea can become applicable to the campaign. Add that additional creative challenge to it. And many people respond to that. Um, another expectation that uh, I've come to, to learn that we have to set is that of the evaluators. And when you're evaluating new ideas that are coming in, Many times the ideas won't be completely, thoroughly thought out and baked. Uh, there will be some, some holes and, and assumptions that are in them, uh, but that's okay. This is just the idea stage. A lot of these things need to be verified. And so if you're a cynical evaluator, it's going to be really easy to, to poke holes and, and, and find uh, the, the problem with things. But I found that with uh, just a little bit of, of, of training and explanation, uh, I talk about uh, Edward de Bono's six thinking hats uh, a lot to our evaluators. And then they kind of say, oh, all right, now I think I can be a little bit more compassionate uh, and understanding when looking at, at some of these ideas. Um, then going over to the sponsors as well, being able to, to set the expectations properly. One of the lessons that I've learned is that uh, you have to be patient with managers uh, and getting them used to being in the problem space as opposed to in the solution space. Uh, managers, almost by definition, get promoted most of the time because they're really good at solving problems. And when you're really good in a particular field uh, or, or, uh, of, of art, you get promoted because you're capable of doing that. And so, talking to, to sponsors and, and asking them to have the humility to say, yeah, I actually don't know how to do this, but I have a goal that reaches further than what my capabilities are right now. Sometimes that makes managers pretty nervous. So uh, it takes a lot of time and patience, but it's well worth it. If you can get uh, a manager who's looking to truly be transformative instead of just managing and maintaining the status quo, a campaign can be a wonderful, transformative thing. Great, great. So a lot of our viewers are new to innovation management. Um, this has been uh, uh, really insightful for them. Um, what kind of advice would you give for new innovation practitioners, someone who wants to create their own innovation program? All right. Well, uh, as I've said a couple of times uh, already, I would say the first of, first of all, Resist the temptation to set up an online open suggestion box. Um, that was our knee-jerk reaction. If we were able to start all over again and press the reset button, we wouldn't do it that way. Uh, and in fact, it's taken us uh, the, the time where we figured out that that wasn't a good idea, and then the time to culturally repair that and get people thinking into the new paradigm uh, it took a considerable amount of time. So if I, I would say just don't even start there. That, that would be a strong piece of advice. Um, 
Secondly, <clears throat> make sure that you put in the effort to respond to every submission that comes in. And this becomes easier when you do have focused campaigns as opposed to an open uh, suggestion box. Um, idea submitters, they don't mind hearing no. We can't do this, especially if you provide a little bit of context, um, which is maybe we don't have the budget or there were some other ideas that we wanted to move forward with. They don't mind hearing no. What they really uh, don't like is not hearing anything at all. Mm -hmm. If your suggestion uh, or idea management platform starts to feel like it's just a black hole where ideas go to die, your, your participation is going to fall precipitously. So you, you got to make sure you respond to every submission. Uh, I would say uh, as a third point here, get the submitter involved at any chance that you have. Uh, we talked about the intrinsic motivation that submitters uh, feel when they have the opportunity, opportunity to work on their idea. And so one of the things that we've done now is in the submission form for our campaigns, when you have an idea, the last question is, tell us what level of involvement would you like to have if we decide to move forward on this idea? Now, some people say, you know what, quite frankly, I just wanted to suggest it. If you could take this idea, you could run with it, and uh, I just wanted it to be considered. That's OK. Um, there are other people who want to say, uh, you know what, I really believe in this idea, and if only I had the green light, I would set up the meetings. I would try to fight for the budget. I would champion for this idea if given the chance. And why wouldn't you want to support uh, an effort like that? So make sure that you really invite the idea submitters to be part of the process if you can. Um, another point, uh, we, we've come up with a phrase here that buying a saw doesn't build a house. And what I mean by that is, when you do purchase and install uh, an idea management uh, platform, the, the technology to get that in place uh, is, uh, that can be, uh, I won't say an inconsider uh, 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 insignificant effort, uh, but it can be done. It's a technical problem that can be solved. But just having the tool itself uh, isn't going to ensure adoption. There are personalities that you're going to have to work with, permissions that you're going to have to try to gain. And again, it's setting these expectations. Uh, it's really a people challenge to get people to, to think about how they're going to uh, want to participate in this system. So don't underestimate the, um, the effort to uh, nurture the, uh, the, the, the attitudes and the training that's going to be needed uh, and depending on your culture, uh, that could be uh, an easy process or it could be a significant process. And then finally, um, when starting a new program like this, make sure that you lean into the challenge, but don't overreach. And I think that's another thing that uh, we did by accident, if we could press the reset button. When we launched, we went company-wide right away, and we were blessed with a ton of ideas coming in and we were drinking from a fire hose mm -hmm. and we couldn't handle it. I would recommend that instead um, find some of those willing managers or, or functional department uh, leaders who would be able to see themselves as transformative change agents who are willing to have the modesty to say, I don't understand how we can do this, but I'm willing to see how the crowd can help us achieve these goals. And then when you run a couple of those campaigns, then you'll be able to have success stories and show the others who might be more skeptical, skeptical that this is a value-adding exercise and something that could be adopted. Because it could be very scary at first. So in, in our opinion, uh, take it slow. Uh, always try to move for a wider expansion and adoption into the company at large but make sure that you are moving at a pace to where you can continually be growing on success. Great, great. That, that's great advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, I have to ask, uh, and the viewers can't see this, so I'm going to lift this up. I've got to ask, um, you brought this today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, could you, could you, could you ex explain what, what that is? All and, right, and okay, sure, sure. So, so this, is, this is our 
an, an innovation hard hat, right? I, I put this on sometimes uh, when I do some trainings and things. You know, this, this serves a, a couple of different purposes. One, I mean, it's kind of silly, right? And, and uh, I, I wear this to remind people that innovation should be fun, right? We shouldn't take ourselves too seriously with this. And at the same time, innovation is messy. Right? You know, it, it's like a construction site where it can be a little dangerous, right? Um, uh, but you should always start with at least a blueprint of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to build. You don't want to build a skyscraper without any plan at all. But in the midst of building it, while you have your plan, uh, there's, you know, get your hands dirty. Innovation is a contact sport. You have to get into it and sometimes you have to to risk uh, getting some knocks uh, you know on the head sometimes so we want to keep ourselves safe but at the same time you know it's it's okay to, uh, to 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 be a little silly and have fun i love it i love it um, so i think uh, you know i want to thank you again for your time i think all the viewers would like to thank you as well and and they could really uh, benefit from your years of experience in this uh, field of study um, so we'll uh, take questions at the q a and uh, back to you patrick Thanks, Dave and Paul, for those best practices in idea management. I can tell you from personal experience that best practice on being ready to reply is critical. Whether with employees or customers, if you ask to open up a dialogue, you need to be ready to respond. Great best practice. Before we head over to Q&A in a second, I want to remind everybody that right after Q&A, go over to the exhibitor area and talk to Paul and the Bright Idea guys. They can help you understand more about how idea management can work in your organization. Let's head over to Q&A.